Before we get started, we have a short message from our friends at Airwave Media. Hey there, I'm Tyler, the host of Wake Me Up, the only guided morning routine podcast. No matter how you'd like to start your day, Wake Me Up has something for everyone. Whether you'd like a calming meditation, some easy yoga and stretching to wake your body, or an inspirational talk to get you motivated for the day, you can find all of it on Wake Me Up. So trade the snooze button for an episode of Wake Me Up and see how your days change. Just search Wake Me Up in your favorite podcast player. At a time when change is constant and we are pulled in far too many directions, we need a way to stay present to life and to increase our ability to remain calm, think clearly, and maintain our well-being. Many studies indicate mindfulness improves our mental, emotional, and physical health. On a Mindful Moment with Teresa McKee, you can learn how to practice mindfulness and enjoy its many benefits. Tune in for guided meditations and to hear tips and advice from some of the most respected experts in the fields of mental health and mindfulness. The world truly can be a better place. It all starts with a mindful moment. Hello, I'm Cheryl, and this is Sleep Tight Relax, a calming bedtime podcast for the young and young at heart. Our sleep story is the first part of a story about Little White Wing. Little White Wing is a flamingo. He is loved by his parents and grows up in a place with lots of other baby flamingos. When all the flamingos start turning pink, Little White Wing stays white. After a while, the king decides Little White Wing can no longer stay with them. What will he do? But before we continue with our story, let's turn down the lights. Get cozy in your bed, close your eyes, and feel warm and secure. Now that we have done that, let's use our imagination a little bit. Let's imagine that you are blowing up a balloon every time you exhale. You can make this balloon as big as you'd like and give it whatever color you want. It could be rainbow colored or have animal prints all over it. I would like you to take a great big breath in through your nose and exhale through your mouth, blowing up your imaginary balloon. This is no ordinary balloon. It's a balloon you can ride in. Once you get it as big as you want, it detaches from your mouth and it drifts slowly up into the sky, taking you with it. There is a strong breeze right now, and your balloon drifts over the trees. You can see your home, the street you live on. Slowly but surely, your balloon takes off, and you can land it anywhere you like. Land it in your favorite place. This could be your bedroom or the couch at a friend's house. Or maybe it's a place to buy ice cream. Let's stay here a few moments and then when you are ready, take a few more deep breaths. Each time exhaling into the balloon and it slowly takes you again for another ride. Perhaps it can take you right into our story about Little White Wing, or right back into your bed again. Great. 
Let's continue with the first part of the travels of Prince Flamingo. The wonderful adventures and the long, beneficent reign of Prince Flamingo are matters which would be lost to the world were it not for the vulnerable Mrs. Leatherback. For Mrs. Leatherback is not only the oldest and the largest of the great turtles, but she is by odds the most distinguished and is gifted with the most accurate power of memory. And her adventures in the 500 years of her life have been many. She swims the great gulf from coast to coast. She knows the islands, every one of them. She has been far up the rivers which pour their floods into the tropic seas, and every bay and lagoon knows her presence. And there is no one whose arrival is more eagerly welcomed by the little people of the lagoons and the coral coves than she. For with her vast knowledge goes a power of recital which charms her listeners. And if she chances to spend a moonlight evening by some quiet swamp or beneath a pleasant sand dune where the breeze is good, and the outlook charming, you may be sure that the intelligent and conservative members of society, such as the cranes, the terrapins, the black swans, and perhaps one of the wise foxes, will be gathered around the distinguished visitor. And her stories, notably that of Prince Flamingo, have gone far inland, even to the remote north. For the heron is himself a great traveler, and it is indeed, as he has presented the story, rather than in the words of Mrs. Leatherback, that it is generally related. Perhaps it has gained something in its travels, for time and distance lend a charm and the coral islands are beautiful in perspective. To put it simply, you remember what the wise old Mr. Rat said as he nibbled the Dutch cheese. The best things come from a long way off. So it is from a remote past and from the most lonely and most beautiful of the tropic islands that the romance of the beautiful white flamingo has traveled down to us. There is a great lagoon or inlet of the sea which widens itself into a vast marsh in the southernmost end of an island. Ships can never enter its shallow waters and it is protected on the land side by miles of dense reeds and water growth. No place in the world could be safer for the city of the flamingos. And of all birds, the great pink flamingos need a secret place to build their nests and raise their young. Their wonderful city was crowded with thousands of their kind on the beautiful morning when this particular little flamingo was born. For never had an enemy made it to their home, and their natural enemies were few. Great flocks of flamingos were wheeling in long, curving lines overhead, and they were so pink against the early morning sky that you would have thought them the reflection of the rosy dawn itself. And almost as far across the lagoon as one could see, they were standing by their nests, feeding their babies, or preparing for flight to the distant feeding grounds. You could see nothing but their tall red forms, thousands of curving necks, and wide, beautiful wings. 
everybody was talking, and the confusion would have been terrible, except for the fact that no one seemed to pay any attention to anybody else, and each beautiful flamingo seemed to know exactly what he was doing. Hundreds of other babies were being hatched that morning, and so Little White Wing, as they called him at first, attracted no attention. His mother was in a great state of delight over him, of course, and his stately father eyed him with approval. But hundreds of other parents were in the same state of mind over their young, and congratulations had long gone out of fashion. The beautiful young father had just arrived from the distant shore and was the first to feed the pretty youngster. He curved his graceful neck downward, and when he kissed the baby, as you might say, it was to put into his mouth the wonderful juice of the shellfish, which the great bird had been eating. While he did this, the mother preened her feathers and took a few stately steps to stretch her legs, for she had been sitting all night on the nest. And then she wheeled in a wonderful circle over the lagoon, mounting higher and higher until at last she was in line with many flamingos who were heading with tilted wings against the wind on their way to the beaches and sandbars. The sun grew very hot and the wind died away. The waters of the lagoon flashed in the burning light and the heat was terrible. But over the nests where the babies lay, the tall birds threw their shadows. And again and again, little White Wing was turned over in his bed and was given countless feedings. So at last, when the sun went down and the air grew cool, he was surprisingly different from what he had been in the morning. He was already larger, and his wings and his feet were getting strong enough so that he could move, and he had found a little voice of his own. With successive days, he grew quickly, and at last he tumbled himself out of the nest and began to walk. The nest was a mound of mud and sand, and not very high, so White Wing could struggle back into it when the heat of the day came. And his watchful father took his post by the side of the little home to throw his shadow over it. At first, White Wing was just like the other little flamingos, and with them, he began to play on the sandy floor of the Flamingo City. And with them, he very soon learned to take short flights as his wings developed. But just as a hundred or so of cousins began to shed their white down and to grow very brown and fuzzy, he began to get whiter and whiter. In a few weeks, they were beginning to shed their brown clothes or the beautiful pink feathers which are the proper thing for a flamingo. Little White Wing was somewhat distressed when his playmates began to jeer at him, and it was perplexing to note a lack of affection on the part of his father and mother. Nothing like this had ever happened in their family, and so far as the handsome father could learn by asking the oldest birds of Flamingo Town no one had ever heard of a white flamingo. The neighbors whispered all day long about Little White Wing. Every night the little fellow would bury his head close to his beautiful mother's ear and say, Don't you think perhaps, mother, that I'll be pink in the morning? 
and she would tell him not to worry and to go to sleep. But when morning came, he would be as white as ever, and his long, sad day would begin. No one would play with him, and he was soon shifting for himself. Somehow he picked up a living of tiny fish in the long pools of tide water that the waves left in the soggy lagoon. And when all his playmates had gone to bed and it was safe to come among them, he would step home, picking his way between the nests and trying to reach his own nest without calling attention to himself. All this was hard, but it quickly grew worse. The king of the flamingos said that the white flamingo must go. Be gone, my child, be gone, the mother whispered to him, for she had heard that little white wing was going to be taken away. Go away as far as you can. One day it will be all right. Always remember that your parents love you. So that ended White Wing's childhood. Even before the first streak of dawn, the beautiful young bird flew out and away. Across the lagoon, miles and miles to the west, over a wide stretch of sea, he flew until his wings could hardly hold him up. Then he saw land, and he strained every nerve to reach it. When at last he wheeled down to the sands in the shade of a great mangrove tree, his first day's flight was finished, and he was a lonely, starving bird on a strange shore. But a deep, sweet voice suddenly came to him, At first, he could not place it. Then he saw, to his astonishment, a huge turtle, only a few yards below him on the beach. Aha, she was saying in her most affectionate way. So there you are. I've heard of you. They drove you out, did they? Well, well, Sonny, cheer up. Then this large and hardy creature pawed her way heavily up the sands and continued her remarks. Funny creatures, you birds. Now look at me and consider the difference. I don't care a clam what my children look like. I'm on my way up to that sand dune this very minute to lay about nine dozen eggs. And I hope they hatch and the young ones won't get eaten up. But they can come out of that shell any color they please, for all I care. We turtles don't worry. We just float along easily. That's the way to live. Then she gave a hearty laugh and settled down to digging a pit in the white sands. Suppose you run along, Sonny, and pick up your supper. I rather like my own company when I'm laying eggs, but make sure to come back a little later and I'll tell you your fortune. No one had ever called him Sonny before, and never had he dreamed that such high good humor existed anywhere. The good old turtle and her cheerful ways had suddenly made life worth living. And poor White Wing, on coming to himself, realized that he was very hungry. He feasted on fiddler crabs, which he otherwise would not have touched. And the moon was high, and he was heavy with sleep when Mrs. Turtle, after hours of scratching and pawing, had patiently buried her eggs and was ready to talk. What she had to say was brief, but it cast the life of White Wing in strange places. And it was on her words that he made his great journey. You're bound to be somebody, she began, probably a king, but this is no place for you around here. 
You must go where you are wanted, and that is a long way from this quiet spot. There's a great emperor who has a palace by the smoking mountains. He's been wishing for a white flamingo all his life. If you can get there, why, your fortune is made. If you fly with your feet to the sunrise until you come to the great river mouth, and if you follow that river long enough, you'll see the mountains with the fiery tops. That's the place. And you want to walk right in as though you owned the kingdom. Don't be scared when you get there. Just forget about those saucy cousins of yours back home and be as grand as you know how. Poor White Wing was almost dizzy at this unexpected vision of good things. He did not focus on what the journey meant, but the motherly old turtle was particular to tell him of the many islands he must pass and the dangers that he would encounter. Then she bade him Godspeed and began her difficult way down the sands, for she was intent upon reaching deep waters again. I have a long way to go, she said, and added that sometime they would be sure to meet again. The second morning found White Wing far out at sea once more, straining his eyes for the island where he was to get food and water, and holding dear to himself but one idea, to reach the great emperor who wanted a white flamingo. After many days and nights of lonely travel, he came to a mountain, solid green and black, with palms and forest trees, where there were no white shores, but a heavy, marshy line of wonderful vegetation. And from the height at which he flew, he could discern the muddy strip of river water which stained the blue sapphire of the ocean. This, then, was the river, and far up its course must be the mountains and the city of the great emperor. He was right in his guess, for a black bird with a yellow bill as big as a cleaver greeted him with familiar and jovial laughter and told him that he was indeed on the right path. This bird was a toucan, and he told many things about his family to White Wing, adding much good advice. He was distressed that the beautiful stranger would not eat bananas, and explained that he owed his good health to an exclusive fruit diet. But then he admitted with a noisy laugh, Somebody must eat the fish, I'm sure, and I'm glad that you like them. Also, this happy-go-lucky toucan volunteered to guide White Wing on his flight up the valley. But before he had accomplished all that he promised, he left. For scarcely had the two traveled a day's journey when they came upon an enormous growth of wild figs, and the greedy toucan would go no farther. Those were hard hours for poor White Wing. The river valley was dark and hot, and in the night he was constantly woken up by the startling sounds around him. Such noisy parrots he had never dreamed of, nor such millions of burning insects that flashed and flashed their lanterns till the heavy vines and palm leaves seemed a fire with them. But the days brought him at last to higher ground, and finally to a wonderful plain where it all seemed but so many miles of lawn and clear, smooth waters. He took heart. Suddenly the mountains came into sight. Yes, 
and one of them was sending out a thin stream of smoke into the cloudless sky. Another day, possibly that very night, he would reach the city of the emperor. Very wisely, he waited for the dawn. He had seen the high walls and the housetops and the glittering decorations on the palace as they glowed in the sunset. And he had heard strange music, a sweet confusion of lovely sounds. But from the cliffs above the river, he watched and waited and preened his beautiful white suit. When morning came, just as the mountains were pink and the city was cool and gray, a grand procession mounted a great rock above the emperor's palace. Trains of people were there, the sounds of drums and a heavy chanting. The emperor was to greet the sun. Then white wings soared high above them all. His great white form was suddenly thrown against the rising sun, and it was beautiful beyond comparison. No living bird had ever seemed so lovely. He could see the crowds of men and women start back in one motion of surprise. Then he floated down, slowly and with great calm, landing beside where the emperor was staring in amazement. From that hour, after the court had recovered from its surprise, Whitewing was almost an emperor himself. A park was made for him, and the tenderest of juicy fish and juicy snails were given him to eat. He had a gold chain and a clasp of blue jewels. The jewels and the beaten gold and the turquoise were made into a neck chain, which he wore with great dignity. Never could the emperor enter into his councils and audience without the Prince of the Dawn, as he was called, and White Wing was a sage and judicial counselor. He would stand for hours on one leg, his jewels flashing, his head turned at a knowing angle, as if in deep thought, a very embodiment of wisdom beside the throne. But in reality, he was sound asleep. For years he dwelt in splendor and acquired great wisdom. And for the little princes and princesses who were many and lovely, he had great affection. But of his love for one princess in particular, and the jealousies which grew up so that his life was again in trouble, there is another story, which the wonderful Mrs. Leatherback is always slow to tell. She has been known to depart and pursue her business in foreign lands, returning at her leisure, before she will be persuaded to tell the rest of the story of Prince Flamingo. And that is the end of this part. Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs>